Welcome to the online teaching ministry of Pastor Rob Ginter and Farmdale Baptist Church. For more content, visit us online at farmdalebaptist.com. It's been a few weeks ago, but I was walking through my neighborhood, and they were dropping like flies. I was inviting people to a VBS, and there was all kinds of people out on the street, but after I, after I went to the first house and I came back out, and they just all of a sudden started hiding in their houses. It made me feel like I was single again trying to find a date, right? Just walking through and people were like, not today, brother. But God showed me much grace. Amen. And why is it like that, right? Why, why do you, you, you were home five minutes ago, but now you're hiding in your house? Is it because I look like that shady of a character in which we're like, he might rob us? That's where he got his name from. He's robbed people all the time. Is that really why it is? Well, let me tell you something else. Let, let's, let's go back, shall we? Several years ago, um, let me tell you, you have done this, but you would go to the wall and after your phone rang and you would pick it up not having any clue who was on the other end. You answered the phone call of strangers, you animals. <laughs> you know what else you did? I'll go even further, right? You're driving down the road, and there's a guy on the side of the road, and he would stick out his arm, and he would pop open that thumb. And some of us would pull over. Because that was the universal sign that he needed a ride. How did we not all die? <laughs> hey, stranger, come get in this passenger seat. Not a big deal. Hey, kids, meet so-and-so. I picked him up on the side of the road just now. <laughs> the other day, I was driving through Frankfurt, and I saw couple of hitchhikers. I don't know if you saw them. They were down here on the road, and they had a cardboard sign. And, and what, what was I expecting on the sign? Help or whatever? No. You know what it said in bold Sharpie? We don't stink. <laughs> That's what they were advertising. We don't stink. So if I were to write a book for hitchhikers, like a hitchhiker's guide, what I would do is I would take a page from these people and be like, let them know. If they get in your car, they're not going to smell the place up. Now, here in 1 Peter, uh, Paul, uh, Peter does similar, right? So what's, what's the deal with strangers on your porch, strangers on your phone, strangers in your car? We all avoid them now. We all avoid them now. So if I'm, I'm taking cues from the non-stinking hitchhikers, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them to do that, right? The lovable, and, the lovable, hygienic hitchhikers. Do something to overcome their fear of strangers. So what happens here in the book of 1 Peter is Peter writes to a group of people who are strangers in a land in which that they do not belong. And who are the strangers? Christians. Christians. He writes to us who are Christians because we do not belong in this world. And what does he do? He gives us kind of a guide for how we ought to live in a world that we don't belong in. Isn't that helpful? Specifically in this passage we look at today, we see the, the three um, ways that we ought to live in a world that we don't belong. That's kind of a how-to for strangers. And why the premise of this is that we should live differently in the world because this isn't the one that we belong in. This isn't the one. These aren't the droids you're looking for or the apples. It's a joke. But 1 Peter is written like this in 1 Peter to give you a little history in the back. 
he writes to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. So who he's writing to? Those who are, in context, chosen by God, exiled to a place that they don't belong. So what is the Christian life? Being chosen by God and living in a place that you don't belong in. That's what the Christian life is. It's the life of an elect exile. So, what does he tell us to do here in 1 Peter chapter 2 as elect exiles in a land that we don't belong in? What does he do? Does he tell us to rise up and fight against this place? Struggle against the place in which we don't belong? Is that what he does? Well, actually, no. It's, it's the exact opposite. Because beginning here in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says this, because you don't belong here, struggle with yourself. Struggle with yourself. You go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Shouldn't we struggle with the world that we don't belong in? I mean, to, to an extent, to an extent you should. But you should struggle with yourself. Look at verses 11, uh, beginning in verse 11. He said, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Do you see that in verse 11, that the biggest, the, the first issue that he deals with is not the corrupt government, it's not the sinful world, it's the sinful skin that you're in. That's what he deals with. He doesn't deal with them out there. He deals with you in there. That's what he does. You're an elect exile. God has saved you. And because of that, you should stay away from the desires of the skin you're in when you live in a world that you don't belong in. When you're in a world that you don't belong in, you should struggle with the skin you're in, to put it a different way. The very existence of this conversation telling Christians that they should put away these passions should awaken us to a war that exists. God has saved us from the ultimate judgment and has ultimately won the war. But there are more wars to fight than whether or not you're going to heaven ultimately or hell. He writes these in context to a group of people who are going ultimately to the presence of God when they die. That war has already been won by God in Christ for you. And what does he do? He says, wage this war, the passions of the flesh. It's a continual removal of sin and the desires that we have here. Hebrews 10, 14, the writer says this about what Jesus has done in the life of the believer, that by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So ultimately you have been perfected for all time and you should be making war here in 1 Peter as you are being sanctified. In one sense, Jesus has forgiven your sin if you are a Christian, and God looks at your record and he sees Christ. What we talked about last week in Acts, he sees Christ's big, fat zero in the sin column when he looks at you. That's what he sees. He sees him who knew no sin when he looks at you on your record. However, in another sense, we're, be commanded, we're commanded to live a life repenting of our sin. Sin that's been revealed to us. In other words, sanctification is a process. And what does it look like? Putting things away. Putting things away. Abstain from the passions of the flesh. Desires that remain. Elsewhere, Paul describes these these passions. He says, now the work in Galatians 5, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. Things like these. 
Peter would tell us to put these things away because they're waging war at the core of who you are. That's what they're doing. That part of you that will last forever, neither heaven or hell, these things are waging war against that part of you. Peter calls it a war and he uses a word that means it's a long-term campaign. Long-term campaign. So if, if you're a Christian and you've been a Christian at any point in time, you realize that what you're dealing with in your life is a long-term campaign. It's not a skirmish. Your, your anger problem is not a skirmish that you fought and won one time. And it never came back again, did it? Your anger never came back. No, it's a long-term campaign. Those desires for someone other than your spouse outside of your marriage, it is not a moment, a one-time deal, right? That you, you lusted once and it was over. You thought about lustful things once and it's gone. Never to rise its ugly head up again. No, 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 no. It is a long-term campaign, a long-term campaign against your soul. You used to envy, didn't you, in your lesser days? You used to look at your neighbor and covet things. And now you look at their, their, their bass boat and their house and their bank account, and you're fine not having any of those things. Or, this is a long-term campaign. A long-term campaign. Now the problem is, if there's two boxers that walk into a building, and one knows he's there for a match, and the other one thinks he's watching a stand-up routine, which one wins? The one who knows that there is a fight. The one who knows that there is a fight. Otherwise, it's over before it starts. As one commentator put it, let go and let God doesn't really work. Doesn't really work in this instance. You need to go to war against what is going to war against you. That's what you should do. War has been declared. There's a declared war on your core. Will you rise to the occasion or be slaughtered in the way? We see the lives and the casualties of those who have been slaughtered in the way. Those who didn't think it was that serious. It's the first one to go down. The next one to go down is the one that thought it was serious for a minute and then the war was over. That's the next one to go down. Ultimately, the one that doesn't understand that it is a war goes down before all of them. As John Owen puts it, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. It'll be killing you. Now, there's two reasons, two reasons here in the text that your status as an exile ought to lead you to fighting for, against sin in your life. There's two reasons. On one hand, the desires you have or whether or not you're realizing it, they're coming after your soul. But on the other hand, the main reason he urges you to fight the sin in your life is because you are living your life before a watching world. Before a watching world. He words it like this, if you look at verse 12. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. You see that? You don't belong here and therefore put away the desires of the skin you're in. What feels natural to you. As, as one rapper put it, don't follow your instincts because your end stinks. <coughs> Not just because your end stinks, but because the world is watching you. The world is watching you. The world is watching. Your 
conduct among the Gentiles. That's the, his slang for those who are not God's people. So what he's saying there by verse 12 is that the war is on in verse 11 and verse 12 is the people are watching this war. People are watching this war, and the moment that you do not give in to their idol of money to make your decisions based on solely your financial interest, the moment you don't do that, then you're going to see your good deeds. You're going to see your good deeds. The moment that you don't do that, the moment that you're generous in a way that confuses people, you're generous in a way that doesn't make sense. You're confusing generosity. What are they going to do with that? Are they going to look at you ultimately and go, wow, you're a weirdo? Probably. But what's the ultimate goal of that in verse 12? That they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So why should we put away the passions of our flesh and wage war against the skin we're in? Because the world is watching us and ultimately God is watching the world and one day they will stand before him. There will be a day of visitation in which they, God and them get together. And the scriptures tell us that that's going to be a judgment day. And what does God want us to do ahead of time according to verse 12? He wants us to have good deeds that they see and not glorify us, but our deeds to put God on display. And that will glorify God on the day of his visitation. When I was reading through this, it was convicting to me because is my life weird enough to be scrutinized by those who haven't been called out of the world? Is my life weird enough? Not like trying to be Amish. Um, that's not what we're talking about, strange. We're talking about not giving in to the natural inclinations that we're in and not not only not giving in to them, waging war against them and doing good deeds to glorify God on the day that they're going to stand before him. That's what he tells us to do. Now, naturally, when we're looking here at 1 Peter chapter 2, we would assume that he'd say, because you guys don't belong here in the world that you're in, rise up to your leaders, struggle against them, fight the power. Is that really what he's talking about here? No, no. First, he says to fight yourself. Fight yourself. Struggle with yourself. Deal, you deal with you. Your biggest problem, the guy in the mirror. That's why Michael Jackson wrote that song. Because it starts with the man in the mirror. But what about the government? What about the government? Okay, first, first I'm starting with the man in the mirror telling him to change his ways. I got you. The message couldn't have been any clearer. Now, now let's rise up against them. Shall we? Is that what we should do? No, 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 no. Actually, the opposite again of what you're expecting. Because you don't belong here, struggle with yourself. And then secondly, submit to your leaders. Submit to your leaders. Submit to your leaders. Go with, verse, go with me to verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the, to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Do you see what he's doing there? That's what he says, that we should submit to every human institution whether it be the governor, the emperor, animal control, whatever, whatever that is, we should submit to those authorities. Now, 
Peter's audience, the original audience that, we, that, that this was written to, was ruled by vassal kings who ruled by Roman permission. And most of them, most of this audience would be directly under these governors. As for the emperor that he's talking about here, ultimately this would have been Nero for you students of history, church history. He burned Christians alive to light the gardens at night. He's very famous, mentioned in a lot of sermons if you've been in the church at any time. He turned Christians into lanterns. And he had them torn apart by beasts for show, for fun. They didn't have Netflix. They let a Christian loose in an arena and had him chased by a lion. That's who he's talking about. So that, my friends, right there is why here in verse 13, it's so important that you're not subject to every human institution purely if they're worthy of it. Purely if they're worthy of it. What do you think about the president? Keep your thoughts silent for now. What do you think about the governor? Not really asking that question. Here's what I will tell you, though. Be subject to them, regardless of what you think about them. Because of verse 13, for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake, not for their sake, not really for your sake, for the Lord's sake. We should submit, and we do so, not because of who they are, but who the Lord is. But who the Lord is. That means we take control of our animals. That means we wear our seat belts, go the speed limit, and everything in between because of the Lord. Not because we agree with those laws, or we agree with those lawmakers, but instead because we are under the Lord in a land in which we don't belong. And this is how he tells us how we ought to live in that land. That's what we should do. He doesn't qualify our obedience at all. Not at all. Instead, we obey. Now, this is not all that the scriptures say on the Christian and the government. Not all that the scriptures say. Christ, uh, the scriptures say. Acts 5.29, they were told to stop preaching Jesus. And how did the apostles respond? Did they respond quoting this verse that wasn't written yet? Did they, did they say, we must be subject to you. You're the boss. Is that what they said? No. Acts chapter 5, verse 29, they were told to stop preaching, and they said, we must obey God rather than man. We must obey God rather than man. So, here we are, we're struggling with ourselves, with the sin that we're, skin that we're in, the sin in the skin that we're in, there you go. And, and not only that, we're submitting to our leaders, not for who they are, but for who the Lord is. And he tells us to do this, but the overarching storyline of the scriptures tell us there's limits to this. There's limits to our obedience. There's limits to our obedience. There is. There's reasons for our obedience. Verse 14 says, Governors are sent by God to punish evil and praise those who do good. So God has ordained these structures and ordained how we treat them. Peter's assuming that our lives in the world that we don't belong will be scrutinized. And when they put us under the microscope and they scrutinize us, what should we do? We shouldn't be a bunch of lawbreakers. Don't be shady characters who, who cut corners. It's not optional. Look at verse 15. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Do you see how this completes who we're supposed to be? In verse 11, he says, you should abstain from the passions of the flesh. There's urges inside that we shouldn't give in to. But lest we become people who are known for not doing certain things, verse 15 says, this is the will of God that we do good things. So put, 
bad things away, do good things specifically here. And that work will silence the critics. Silence the critics. Because they don't blend in, they stand out, and they, when they're scrutinized, they do good. Do good. Think about the opposite. How disgusting would it be if we're called to do good and transform and they look at us and we come up dirty in this. So we should submit to our leaders, not just the government, but also work. Ouch. Did you hear that one? Work. Verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So this passage is specifically talking about household slaves in Peter's day. This is likely talking about an upper class of servants. As one commentator notes, the most oppressed slaves who work in mines, like actual, uh, closer to what we would understand as slavery, wouldn't have had access to Peter's letters and are probably not being addressed here. This is talking about people who are working, serving in order to better their lives. Do you see here that all of this is under the umbrella of Christ? All of it. So you're, you're a Christian And this is how you should be at work. A Christian. A Christian. Here, here's what he's trying to protect us from. You, are, you cut corners at work. You do stuff that you shouldn't do. Your boss comes to you and says, you messed the numbers up big time and cost us a lot of money. You're fired. You leave. You call your wife. Or your husband, and you say, honey, the Lord Jesus said in this life you will have troubles. Take heart, I have overcome the world. I'm suffering for Jesus here at work and I just got fired. You see what he's trying to do here? That there would be scrutiny on your life and that you would come up faithful in that. He's trying to tell us how to live. And he gives us the structures and even the marital structures beginning in verse, uh, in chapter 3. Wives, be subject to your own husbands, etc. He's trying to tell us how to work under and within these authority structures. He's trying to protect us when they look at our lives. Because most of us, we, we think of what's going on in Southeast Asia and people are, are being persecuted for Christ and they're dying and that is suffering and persecution but what he's trying to get out here in 1 Peter 2 is the consequences for shady business right you're mean to somebody at work you're the grouchy guy at work somebody's tired of your stuff so they just bark right back at you you walk away and you go I guess we should bear our crosses the Lord said that we should take up our cross and follow him. That's what I'm doing. I'm suffering for Jesus here at the, at the work. Meanwhile, they're gossiping about you on the side going, those jerks for Jesus over there, I don't want to have any business going to their church. He's the meanest guy in this place. So, so when you're short with your spouse, when you're just mean to him, you, you, ha you haven't slept and you just say something. And you know what? They're short right back. They're, they're not long, you're not long suffering with them. You're short suffering. And, and so they're short suffering back. You don't walk away and go, well, you know, I'm being persecuted here in my own home. And it's so sad that I'd be persecuted right here in the house. No, you're not being persecuted. You're reaping what you sow. That's what you're doing. 
So that's why when we're living in a land that we don't belong in, what does Peter do? He tells us how to live in that land. And ultimately, what is it? How, what, what is he getting at that we ought to do within all of these authority structures? Well, first we deal with ourselves saying that we ought to struggle with ourselves. We ought to submit to our leaders. But what do we do, though? Like all of that seems, seems like actively passive in a lot of regards. Well, verse 21 says this, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. You should serve by Christ's example here, finally. So struggle with yourself, submit to your leaders, and serve by Christ's example. You have been called down the same road as the Lord Jesus. That's what you're being called to do here. He was tempted to sin like we were. In every way he was tempted except one thing happened. He did not sin. He did not sin. What does that mean? That means he abstained from the passions of the flesh. He struggled with himself. To the point of sweating drops of blood. He submitted himself to his leaders. He told Peter, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword, and I'm not dying by the sword today. And ultimately, he submitted to his father. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And we are being called to submit that way and to serve that way like Jesus did. Verse 23 says, when he was reviled, and boy was he reviled, he did not revile in turn. He did not fight for his own rights. That is not what he did. Instead, those who did evil to him. Scriptures tell us, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That's what he's doing. Tells us, Peter tells us to be like that when he suffered. Don't threaten. Continue trusting yourselves to the one who judges justly, just like Jesus did. And we wouldn't go down this suffering road if we weren't following Jesus on it. But we are learning here in this passage that if we're called to, that we are called to suffer on this road. We serve by his example. And why would we do that? Well, let me tell you the backstory that God is holy. And he is righteous and just and perfect. He is good and he does good. And all he does and is is right and good and just and holy. His name is wonderful. He created man in his own image. In six days he spoke the world into existence. On day six, his crowning achievement in creation was man. And man rebelled against the Creator. And he sinned by becoming, wanting to become like the Creator. And we were kicked out of the garden. We inherited this nature from our first father, Adam. We do whatever pleases us and we do whatever comes natural to us. We are forever creatures of habit in which that we joy in the path of least resistance. We do what feels natural most of the time. And what does the Bible call that? Sin. The Bible calls that sin. And it has separated us from God. But the good news is that God became a man in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he suffered for our sin, taking it upon himself. He died on the cross 
for our sin and rose on the third day, victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and everything in between. And instead of wiping us out, that's what God did in His Son. Verse 24, He Himself, speaking of Jesus, bore our sins in His body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now we've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You see this, that God is holy and you are not. You are holy, sinful, really, in the way that you were born. He bore our sin on him. Now, he's talking, this is to Christians. Remember, he bore our sin that we might die to sin. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. It doesn't mean that you become sinless going forward. If anyone says they have no sin, they make him a liar and the truth is not in them. So it's not the presence of sin that we die to, but it is the power of sin. That we might live for something else. Do you hear the, the echoes of the elect exiles in verse 24 here? That you might die to the way that they're all living. That you might live a different way. And what's the word he uses to describe the way that you ought to be living for? Righteousness. Righteousness. What does he say next? By his wounds you've been healed. I know you've probably heard that before in, in a prosperity way by his wounds you've been healed but what is he talking about here in context in verses 24 25 he's talking about sin that his wounds are what heals us that he was wounded for our transgressions that he was crushed for our iniquities and the chastisement that brought us peace was upon him What about you? Who were you? Verse 25. You were straying. You were straying like a sheep. Rewind to verse 24. You're now living for righteousness. You live differently. You fight the sin of the skin that you're in. You live by Christ's example. But you were straying. Now you have something to live for, but before, look at your life. You were straying. We use this word a lot. Lost. Lost is what you were. Straying. Like sheep. But have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Do you see what happens here in verse 25? That now you have stability. The world, don't look to, to it for stability. You don't belong there. Don't look inside for stability. You have passions there that are warring against you. So don't look to the world. You don't belong there. Don't look inside. Don't follow your heart. Don't do that. Because you have flesh. And that ultimately leads to you straying, but you've now returned, and now you have a shepherd and an overseer of your souls. You don't belong in this world. You don't belong to the fleshly desires. It makes war against your soul. You belong to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. See how he does this to people in a world that they don't belong in? Do you see that? Let me encourage you with this passage today. That you don't belong here. So if you feel lost, feel like you're straying, return to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. There is one thing steady in this world, and it is not the world. It's not how you feel about it. It's the shepherd and the overseer. If you're not a Christian, you need to return from straying, right? To bank your life solely in the person of the Lord Jesus. 
He is the only steady in a world gone crazy. If you are a Christian, the world's gone crazy, your feelings are run amok, like a roller coaster ride that you're on that you, don't want, that you want to get off on, but you can't get off. Look to the overseer, my friends. Look to the shepherd. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And how do you do that? Do not forget that you don't belong here. Do not forget that your feelings are not to be what drives you because they're connected to your flesh. Don't follow your feelings. They lie to you. Don't follow the world. It lies to you. Don't follow, follow your leaders. They lie to you. Submit to them. But look to the shepherd. Look to the overseer. He is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should change his mind. He neither changes nor lies. He is the only steady for us, my friends, in a world that we don't belong in. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your scriptures. Thank you for the steadier of our souls, the shepherd and the overseer, the one that watches us, the one that's taking care of us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus who died on the cross for our sins and rose on the third day. Now shepherds and overseers sees us at the very core of who we are. Please introduce yourself to people in this room. Please do work in our hearts. Turn all our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen.